and welcome to Concordia Live. For those of you who are new here, my name is Joe Milbank, a member of the Concordia team, and I would like to thank you for joining us here today. A special thank you to our Global Patron Member and 2022 P3 Impact Award winner, Samrid Healthcare Blended Finance Facility, for organizing this discussion. Samrid is a blended finance facility supported by USAID and implemented by IPE Global in partnership with varied stakeholders from government, philanthropic and financial institutions, private sector, incubator accelerators, and academia. Samrid works to address the weak health systems and persistent shortage of skilled workforce and infrastructure, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic in India. Samrid combines commercial capital with public and philanthropic funds to drive greater investments in market-based health solutions. Globally, there is more and more evidence on the strong correlation between economic opportunities for women and inclusive growth. Countries worldwide are estimated to achieve roughly 20% higher GDP per capita if gender bias and labor force participation is eliminated. Women's economic status can also create positive ripple effects across many social dimensions. Investing in women, therefore, is one of the most compelling strategies to accelerate growth and reduce poverty. Despite this fact, women-owned businesses face many barriers to entry and growth, with access to finance being the biggest hurdle. Studies indicate that 70% of women-owned small and medium enterprises in developing countries are unserved or underserved by financial institutions, amounting to a financing gap and opportunity of nearly $285 billion. In honor of International Women's Day, today's Concordia Live with Samrid will discuss how we can bring a gender lens to investments that target greater participation of women in entrepreneurship and its merits towards solving uh, complex socioeconomic challenges in emerging countries. A few quick housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are automatically muted upon entry, but we hope that you'll take advantage of the chat feature to introduce yourself, react to comments in the discussion, and engage throughout the conversation. To ask a question, please utilize this same chat function at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to answer all questions at the end of the session. Lastly, this webinar will be recorded and available on Concordia's webpage and YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce today's moderator, Rita Kapendi, Associate Director of Health, Nutrition, and WASH at IPE Global. Ritika has more than 14 years of experience with an eclectic mix of technical know-how in public health, research acumen, project management, partnerships, people management, and social behavior change communication. Ritika, over to you. Thanks, Joe. A very warm welcome to the audience and the panel members. Many thanks for taking out time to attend this panel discussion today. We promise we have a stimulating discussion in store for you. Globally and in India, there is enough evidence on the strong correlation between economic opportunities for women and inclusive growth. Giving women better access to financial products and services could unlock $330 billion, U uh, billion dollars in, annual in annual global revenue. A data point from International Finance Corporation suggests that closing the gender financing gap in developing countries could unlock $4.4 trillion in additional GDP. Despite these benefits, women-owned business face many barriers to entry and growth. 80% of women-owned business with credit needs are either unserved or underserved, leading to $1.7 trillion financing gap. Integrating gender lens investing can help address the challenge that women-led business and entrepreneurs face in assessing capital for growth and success, which could unlock their economic and social potential. To discuss this further, we have curated eminent experts for this panel who will bring together various perspectives from donors, financial institutions, women entrepreneurs, and gender policy specialists. Today, we have with us Dr. Neeta Rao, Senior Health Lead with USAID. Neeta has a rich experience of 18 years in health system strengthening, healthcare financing, research and evaluation, policy and program management. Dr. Rao strives to ensure that the most vulnerable and marginalized population in India have 
access to affordable and quality healthcare. Further, we have Mr. Avishek Gupta, Managing Director and CEO at Caspian Debt. Caspian Debt is committed to the 2x challenge and has a track record of supporting women-led and women-impact businesses in India for the past several years through direct funding as well as ecosystem building initiatives. Prior to Caspian Debt, Avishek helped set up a structured finance business in small business lending and affordable housing finance sector. We have Suhani Mohan, who is the co-founder and CEO of Saral Designs, a Mumbai-based startup providing access to quality, affordable hygiene products to low-income communities in Asia and Africa using decentralized manufacturing. Suhani is a board member of IIT Bombay Strategic Advisory Committee, and she has been recognized as the top, trail, top 25 trailblazing women in business by Forbes India and 25 most powerful women in impact by business today. Mitali Nikore is the founder of Nikore Associates. She is a pioneering economic, uh, economist with 12 years of experience in gender mainstreaming, development finance, policy advisory, and social entrepreneurship. She advises leading multilateral organizations such as ADB, UN Women, and the World Bank. She was selected as she is 75 India Women in STEAM, which is Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics by Government of India in 2022, and named one of the 22 for 2022 industrial leaders by Forbes magazine. So now with uh, moving on to our discussion, so we all know that women entrepreneurs can play a critical role in promoting sustainable and inclusive economic development, especially in emerging countries by helping addressing some of the most pressing social and economic challenges faced by these communities. So Suhani, from your experience, what are some of the roadblocks women face in innovation and entrepreneurship? And what are some of the specific areas where you think women entrepreneurs need support to grow their business? You have about four to five minutes to answer this. Over to you. Thank you, Ritika, and thank you for having me here. Good evening, everyone who's joining the panel. Um, so it's a very interesting conversation around uh, barriers for uh, women in innovation and entrepreneurship. and uh, I can divide it broadly into two buckets. One is uh, social behavior change stigma around women in workforce and women in entrepreneurship in general, which acts as a barrier. The more we have conversations like these, hopefully that will keep getting better. Uh, the second is a financial challenge uh, around actually access to capital and where there is a role of biases to play. But more than that, there is... Uh, uh, structural challenges which needs to be solved. So I'll just share a few examples in terms of how it has played because not making it a rhetoric, but really things that have actually happened on the ground, right? So uh, when we, as a social enterprise, we raise capital in form of grants, in form of equity, as well as debt. Um, so there were many situations when we went to raise equity capital, at least in terms of early stage, what happens is... Uh, a lot of decisions are taken based on understanding of the investor about the product itself. And since we work in menstrual hygiene and sanitary napkins, many investors were also men. So for them to understand whether this product is really good or not uh, took a lot of time. And many people were uncomfortable in investing in something that they did not understand. So there were these structural barriers that there, there have to be more women in investing overall, which will help uh, cover some gaps that women entrepreneurs face who are working in women-related uh, issues that probably are not so globally understood. Uh, the second thing is also around mentorship. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to use this word in a lot more detail because I think throughout the journey, whether you're early stage, mid-stage, there is a huge role of coaching advisory that comes in uh, where it it is hard to find good people who can mentor you in your entire journey. Um, and I would say that not just for myself, but representing all the female founders. In fact, we have a WhatsApp group now where we keep sharing these things that there are so many panels or startup events that happen that you'll all only find like one or two women in a pool of 100 men. So just navigating the conversations, building networks over there, 
starts becoming a little uncomfortable for a lot of people i would say that some of these barriers are internal and you know mental that you can solve it themselves but we just need more representation just to make it easier for women to break these barriers and the numbers are very clear ritika you mentioned about it so mentioned about it that the amount of economic impact a women's participation in workforce and entrepreneurship is going to have it's a very important thing for us to solve as humanity and as a country and not really just about uh, women entrepreneurship thanks thanks so ani for for your insights and that brings us to definitely a very important topic on financial gaps and access to finance financial products for women entrepreneurs and i brings me to the next uh, panelist which is abhishek so abhishek would you agree like given the data that jo has given or even i spoke in my introduction like would you agree that there is a clear business case in investing in women led entrepreneur uh, uh, like enterprises what are some of the key driving forces for investors to invest in women led businesses if you could just throw some light on that yeah i mean uh, clearly based on some of the studies that you and jo quote a little early, earlier there is obviously a strong economic uh, reason to support women led companies uh, but more than that you know from an investor's perspective i think there are enough and more studies that have said uh, for example i remember uh, a study by uh, and of course what i'm going to quote as far as the investors is concerned unfortunately is mostly us based uh, in india we have not done such studies as yet uh, there is an effort that is on where we are trying to do that but uh, so for example back in 2015 or 16 i remember there was this uh, study published by first round ventures who said that uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the relative performance of uh, companies uh, that were founded by women uh, the relative performance of uh, such companies were better than uh, male only founded companies it, it it the study also said that uh, uh as far as the capital efficiency of businesses run by women is concerned uh, it was better in women run companies uh, the reason could be that women had access women led companies had lesser access to capital so they made better use of the capital but ultimately it led to better return of return on investments uh there are other studies uh, for example uh, you know by a few uh, accelerators i remember there was a there was a uh, there was a study by uh, bcg which is a consulting firm which said that ultimately it seems that uh, women led businesses deliver uh, twice as much revenue as a male only led company does uh, these are studies done by others so but if you really look at us our, our own experience at caspian debt uh, what what i have noticed is that uh, you know over all these years of 8 9 years of evaluating or funding more than uh, i think we funded more than 230 companies uh, and and uh, what what we've seen is uh, when it comes to the loan applications that we receive uh, the conversion rates of the loan applications of women led companies is approximately about 33 30% uh so basically this is application that comes in and then converts into the next stage for women led companies it is 33% for male led companies it is 18% 18 now from a so what it essentially means uh, at least that's our uh, interpretation is that the quality of companies that are applying for a loan uh from us are better when it comes to women led companies for us as a as an institution or an organization evaluating uh deals it is actually uh you know operationally uh more efficient to look at women led companies because the chances of more number of applications converting into a loan is higher so it saves uh, so so we save the time that we spend on looking at a much larger number of deals that are otherwise not possible to be funded uh what we also noticed is uh, Uh, you know there are several companies that take multiple loans from us there are companies several companies that have taken more than five loans from us and if i look at that cut what i what we've realized is uh, out of those companies that have taken uh, more than five loans from us slightly above 50% of those companies are actually women led 
So it seems that when we have funded women-led companies, more of them come back and take more loans from us over a period of time. So for us, once we onboard that customer, we can do multiple loans. So for us, it's actually uh, from a business sense, it seems that uh, we have a stickier customer when it comes to a women-led company. Uh, so for us, at least, it's it makes complete business sense, uh, you know, based on what we've seen. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Abhishek, for highlighting these points. And actually, um, like there are studies that have shown that women-led businesses generate twice as much as revenue per dollar invested as male-founded firms. So, so it's very much, uh, you know, related to what you mentioned in your, in your conversation. So now I would actually uh, move to uh, Dr. Neeta. So, uh, so for you, uh, I wanted to ask you that women entrepreneurs have been, you know, resolving social issues using innovative solutions for, for a long time. Why is it important to invest in such organizations? And why do we need more of them in leadership roles for social entrepreneurial activities? Thank you, Ritika, for that question. And uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be a part of this panel and uh, this topic, which is so much important. Um, mm -hmm. All the previous speakers have already mentioned about, you know, why it's important to focus on women-led enterprises. Um, and Suhani has very well articulated some of the challenges that uh, women entrepreneurs face. Mm -hmm. And one of the major ones is access to affordable credit. Um, and uh, this actually constrains women entrepreneurs to get into the mainstream and you know, really contribute to the economic uh, output of the country. Um, and some of these challenges actually stem from unconscious bias that investors have towards women-led enterprises. Uh, thereby stagnating their growth. And investors also view women leaders as risk averse, um, which leads to lower funding and investment. Now, despite that, as uh, even Abhishek mentioned, uh, there are women-led enterprises which have shown a larger growth. There is also a larger per dollar investment growth rate uh, among women-led enterprises as compared to male-led businesses in the last five years. And um, uh, also some of you already mentioned about the uh, loan repayment. So majority of female borrowers repay their loans on time. Women borrowers have much lower consumer level 90 day plus delinquency rate of uh, about 5.2% to per, uh, uh, as compared to men who have 6.9% of repayment delinquency rate. So uh, the number of female borrowers is also increasing. Um, and uh, however, they still account just to about 29% of all borrowers. Um, so coming to see uh, women uh, leaders, uh, they play a very important role because they bring in diverse perspectives to the decision making processes and also better decision making. And some of you have already quoted that in subtle way. And this is because women leaders often bring different life experiences, skills and viewpoints to the table. Women are also known to be more resilient and therefore they bring that kind of skill sets uh, to even managing the business. And um, uh, if you look at uh, um, in India, there are more than 8 million women led businesses, but that represents just about 14% of the total businesses. So it is really imperative now more than ever to support and encourage women entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Ritika, you also mentioned this earlier in terms of uh, why they should be in leadership position. Um, so there is a global entrepreneurship monitor, which actually states that uh, women entrepreneurs are more likely to start businesses in sectors um, as healthcare, education, social services, which are more focused on addressing social issues. And I think this was this has been one of the questions also that's come up. Um, so if we actually encourage more of women leaders or leadership in the uh, uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial circles, uh, it is it will actually address the social issues as well. It will promote innovation. Uh, it will support uh, gender equality and also foster economic empowerment. Um, we definitely need more women and leadership roles to ensure that social entrepreneurial initiatives are more inclusive and effective in creating social change. 
Gender lens investing is a very important part of this, which is targeted at bringing more women into the workforce. And it is slowly gaining a lot of recognition worldwide uh, within institutions that are uh, adopting gender inclusion perspective. And a major reason for that is due to some of the untapped potential of women in financial oriented activities. And uh, I think, Ritika, you already mentioned some of those statistics. Um, and uh, the World Economic Forum uh, states that the gender pay uh, gap stands at 16%, meaning the women earning uh, earn 84 cents on an average for every dollar that are earned by men. So uh, women-focused uh, investing would also ensure uh, addressing these issues of uh, gender um, parity in terms of payment, in terms of uh, their convenience of performing in terms of, um, you know, uh, social issues that could be addressed in terms of um, shifting the entire perspective of women as beneficiaries uh, to women as employers and uh, thereby contributing to the uh, uh, to the economic um, uh, well-being of the, uh, not only of the family, but also of the society and the country. Thank you. Thank you, Nita, for your uh, insights on this. And actually uh, wanted to also quote another research which talks about that if there are organ, you know, uh, innovations or startups which are co-founded in like with men and women together, like they are able to develop more diverse products, you know, and, and are able to reach a much larger, um, you know, uh, population because it's much more sort of thought through and much more diverse when, when it reaches out. So I think we're all making a very, uh, you know, strong case towards, uh, you know, gender lens investing, which definitely has inclusive growth inbuilt in it. So, uh, so Mitali, uh, coming to you now, like, uh, like how can commercial institutions integrate gender focus in the overall investment criteria? And what are some of the industry frameworks or criteria that have been designed? And you know, since you come from the like economist background, so just wanted to know that from you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ritika, and thank you very much for having me as part of this panel. Uh, it's been an invigorating experience to actually listen to all of the panelists today because everybody has touched on such a different perspective. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you say, okay, because women have a diverse perspective, that is why they are outperforming, uh, you know, the men. Because we are going on quoting these statistics, right? That uh, investing in a woman leads to 2x returns, etc. I mean, we have to also think about the channels as to why. The first reason, of course, as you mentioned, Ritika, is... Um, going ahead, thinking about the diverse needs of a different audience, which, which may be having a single sex, uh, you know, having a single just male or just female also will not guarantee. But, you know, having that combination guarantees that you're thinking and covering a larger consumer base. But it goes beyond that because as Sohani also very rightly mentioned, you know, there are a number of gender-specific challenges which women entrepreneurs have which you don't see, you know, male entrepreneurs having. One very specific challenge is the lack of networks. You know, we talk about the lack of access to finance. Often we are able to, you know, we are all very privileged to be having this conversation itself. And we have access to certain networks where we know who to talk to if we have a startup idea. We know who to talk to, uh, you know, to run our idea, uh, you know, in front of anybody and say, okay, you know, can you tell me where can I, you know, get financing for this or where do you think I can get, you know, incubation for my idea. But most of the women entrepreneurs, especially the ones that are coming from tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four cities, they don't have access to these networks itself. So the first hurdle that they have to cross and the first hoop that I say they would have to cross is to actually access the right networks and get the right information. That already starts making them more resilient as, as, you know, as Nita pointed out. And then after that, you have to go through bias after bias in the selection process of whether you will get funding. And then you have to look at, you know, how do you dispel some of the stereotypes like Sohani mentioned, you know, the stereotype of unpaid work, the stereotype of, 
uh, you know, asking a woman entrepreneur, but not a male entrepreneur, oh, will you stick with your company if you get married? You know, these kind of questions, which, which are routinely asked uh, to women entrepreneurs automatically make them much more resilient, even if they weren't uh, to begin with. And um, so I think it comes from, you know, it comes from that. And now when we are dealing with gender lens investing frameworks and when we are dealing with, um, you know, companies trying to grapple with this ecosystem where you have the challenge on one hand that you want to bring in more women entrepreneurs in your investment cycle. But on the other hand, when you go out to find those women entrepreneurs, you're not able to find them. Right. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg kind of a situation. So in order to deal with that, what a lot of companies have done is widen the net of what do you call gender lens investing. And one of the examples is a three IE framework, which was developed by an Australian uh, you know, firm which said that, look, for me, gender lens investing is looking at not only the investment life cycle or what I do within my company, but it is to look at what can I do as an investor and how can I innovate in the way I finance? Can I give small loans? Can I give grants instead of just uh, giving these particular types of financial products uh, that I do give at the point at this point? And can I also look at innovation in my ecosystem and start to promote the skill development of early stage women entrepreneurs beyond just looking at financing women-led enterprises. So I think these are the kind of frameworks that are coming up. One of the frameworks that I would love to mention, of course, is the one that we devised as uh, you know, we were working together. Of course, I'll talk about it more later as well, but just to give a glimpse of it, what we realized while you know, we were working on Samrit was that in India, when you go out to find women entrepreneurs, you will find them, but you may not find them in specific sectors. So you may find that there is a preponderance of women entrepreneurs in say textiles or food processing, and, but they exist in the tier one and tier two cities. And then when you go to the tier three, tier four cities, and you specifically say, oh, I'm looking for women entrepreneurs in the healthcare space, or I'm looking for, and then there were a number of other sectors also, Ritika, that you know were coming up in the data, that sectors like electric vehicles, se sectors like electronics, the STEM sectors, you know, these are sectors where you don't see women entrepreneurs, even in tier one cities that are starting to come out. So in that case, what we felt was the way to analyze this is to look at the life cycle of being an entrepreneur and seeing how women are experiencing this entire investment life cycle. That, you know, at the deal origination stage, at the stage of actually submitting your application, at the stage of working with a potential financier, what are the challenges? And then also even in the post application stage, what are the challenges, you know? So at each of these stages, we looked at these four stages, pre-application, application, post application, and then even in the long term, like sort of giving this particular funded entity long-term support, we looked at the entire life cycle and that's the framework that we're really, um, you know, I think we find that it's very robust. And I think the second aspect of our framework, which I would really like to highlight is you know, the difference between women-led, women-owned, women-managed, and then women-focused enterprises that, you know, after, I think, hours and hours and hours of deliberations, all of us said, you know, this is, this is how we should be defining gender lens investing, because we couldn't wrap our heads around it, that if you have two male funders or male founders who are looking at an enterprise that predominantly benefits women, and has women users, you know, as its main sort of base, uh, why should it not qualify for financing under the gender lens investing framework? You know, so, so I think that's where we decided to expand the definition. And uh, there is precedence, ADB led frameworks, IFC led frameworks also uh, do look at, you know, women focused enterprises as a part of GLI. So I think with these frameworks, we've made a lot, lot of progress in defining what GLI looks like for definitely the Indian healthcare sector, but I think even beyond that, um, you know, in, in any sector, really. 
thanks thanks mitali for uh, for your very insightful uh, words and over here i would like to also tell all the attendees that at samrid uh, with uh, you know which is supported by usaid we have been working very closely with uh, you know mitali we and and obviously guided a lot by usaid in in the process to actually craft a gender lens investing toolkit which we are planning to launch uh, very very soon and um, uh, and and that will actually provide a very simple uh, you know toolkit to really you know run the gender lens investing by any investor by portfolio companies to be more inclusive so we are really looking forward to that you know piece of work and and bringing that to the ecosystem so so thanks mitali for for that and um, so now i would like to actually move now that we have discussed uh, like at a much broader level the ecosystem you know uh, you know challenges or the ecosystem ideas that are uh, that are present now i would actually like to go a bit more specific for because we have like such a you know interesting panel and i like and they can contribute a lot more through their individual experiences also so this segment is more around that so uh, so starting with suhani like you did mention about the larger you know challenges and uh, which women entrepreneurs would face but since you are working uh, at a you know uh, like at saral designs you are you are you know designing uh, hygiene products for for women so how did you navigate these challenges really and like that you would actually advise other women entrepreneurs about like just if you could focus on uh, you know two or three challenges in the interest of time thanks um so i think a bunch of this has been covered by mitali already so uh, there is some advantage of being in mumbai navi mumbai is sort of a ecosystem where we have slightly more uh, act, uh, improved access to credit improved access to investors but a few things that helped early in our journey because saral designs was started in 2015 and uh, gender lens investing as a term has been coined a few years ago so a few things that helped us was uh, many organizations started looking at women only incubators women only accelerator programs women only funding challenges that would come across which would give this uh, unique advantage for women entrepreneurs to be able to uh, come together and a cohort based learning also made a lot of difference not just in terms of visibility that all these women are available uh, you know for funding and looking for funding but at the same time there was also a lot of cross learning across uh, entrepreneurs ourselves in terms of shared resources these are places where we can actually raise capital from um secondly i think building this network over a period of time also helps and now that we know there are uh, folks like you in terms of ipe global caspian who have a, a gli flame a framework in place uh, spreading this word in the women entrepreneur community helps each other uh, find more uh, gli oriented investors as well and i feel over a period of time when the gender gap uh, comes you know we we are able to bridge this gender gap over a period of time there would also be a funder of choice and it will start becoming more and more important also for investors as a maybe as a uh, peer pressure or something for them to be more uh interesting for entrepreneurs to include in their journey and that will uh, have to be around diversity inclusion and a bunch of other things as well and i feel that is starting to happen um given all the activities that are happening also one more uh, factor that i wanted to talk about in terms of uh, women in innovation women in stem so it is not just at an entrepreneurship level uh in tier 1 towns so there are multiple colleges which are coming up with incubators for women and with a specific uh requirement of at least having 50% women in their incubator programs in tier 2 tier 3 towns which i feel is super helpful and also looking at women's participation in workforce overall in leadership not just in entrepreneurship so mitali touched upon it that it's not just women owned businesses or women run businesses there is so much to be done at every level because all the second level leadership or entry level leadership now will become the entrepreneurs of the next generation after a decade so we need to also consciously build that uh, as we go forward and uh, 
uh, just quoting uh, something from Act for Women. So they have recently done a survey called Wiser across startups to understand which startups actually do well with their gender balance and what are some structural changes that we can make as organizations uh, to enable more women in workforce so that they become the next generation of us. So those were a couple of things that I have seen have worked over the last uh, decade to improve uh, women in entrepreneurship and women in innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Suhani, uh, for your insights here. And, you know, seeing a successful woman entrepreneur like yourself is not only inspiring for Samrid, like because we have a really long partnership, but also for all the young innovators out there. So, so thanks again. Uh, now, we'll, uh, uh, for, uh, so Dr. Nita, for you, uh, there's a very specific question uh, from the donor angle. So how do you think that donors like USAID uh, you know, have an opportunity to contribute towards integrating gender lens uh, through, you know, your implementing partners or as a mandate for USAID. So over to you, Dr. Nita. Thanks, Rutika. Um, so basically to change the investment landscape, uh, donors act actually need to work with the investors. They need to all come together uh, to create an inclusive ecosystem for women-led enterprises. Um, to begin with, I think Mitali, Suhani, everyone has mentioned this uh, uh, earlier. There are fewer women in leadership roles, whether it is in the financial sector or it is in STEM. Further, investors' bias and a lot of other challenges, lack of equal opportunities, pose challenge to their growth. Uh, we therefore need to take more of an ecosystem approach that first allows women to get a fair chance in these sectors and then uh, provides more support to them to nurture them uh, through a range of uh, different offerings. Um, some of it uh, Mitali has already mentioned, like whether it's mentoring, coaching, access to capital, access to market, so that they can realize their potential. So a very important role that donors can play is be a part of this ecosystem. And they can also provide risk capital to women-led enterprises through their philanthropic and grant funding. Um, as far as USAID is concerned, our development partnership with India emphasizes efforts to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in all our development programs. So we have a gender strategy in, in India, which affirms the White House national strategy to address discrimination and harmful gender norms that affect people of all gender and supports India's own plans to move from a women's development approach to a women-led development. And the overarching goal of this gender strategy is to build momentum that is required among all the stakeholders uh, to close some of these gender gaps in India and to promote uh, gender lens investing. So one of the efforts I would like to mention is USAID's Peer Women in Science Mentoring Program, which supports cohorts of women in faculty positions at higher education institutions in USAID partner countries. And this support constitutes of providing them with skills, supporting networks, which uh, both Mitali and um, uh, Suhani mentioned earlier, seed funding, so that they can remain and thrive in the area of science. And likewise, as um, both um, uh, Ruthika, you and Mitali mentioned, we are supporting the gender lens investing for social enterprises and businesses under SumGrid. Um, basic, the, the whole um, objective with which we started was that, as most of you know, SumGrid is a blended financing facility which mobilizes, which already has a commitment of over $300 million and mobilizes grant and debt funding to provide support to innovations so that uh, they can sustain and scale up. And this is complemented with a st very strong technical assistance so that they are able to unlock newer resources. Now, Samrid is actually committed to providing equal opportunities to women-led enterprises in healthcare. And ever since we began, we actually kept that at the forefront, that we need to identify more of women-led enterprises and uh, support them. But as most of the speakers have already mentioned, there were challenges in identifying them. Even those who came forward had some of the other challenges and therefore we thought we should do a very systematic 
inquiry into what are uh, some of these challenges and how they could be addressed across the uh, investment cycle process. And uh, this toolkit is actually supposed to help investors uh, to look at various factors and uh, take um, a very informed um, you know, decision on the investment portfolios that they need to uh, develop, uh, which can actually enhance gender diversity. And uh, it is it would also provide them with a wide range of gender focused projects itself once they start using this entire framework. And uh, it includes both qualitative and quantitative tools. So Mitali has actually explained a lot of it in detail. So I wouldn't uh, get into that. Uh, but what I definitely want to mention is that uh, uh, promoting gender lens investing actually requires a multifaceted approach that involves a lot of education, looking at data, data analysis, investment screening, and to foster collaboration. And some of these components, especially around evidence gathering uh, and use of this evidence advocacy is something that donors can definitely support um, uh, along with the other key stakeholders in the entire ecosystem. So by taking these steps, I think we should be able to drive positive changes towards a more gender inclusive economy. Thanks, thanks, Nita. It's uh, it's really uh, amazing to see you know leaders like you in the donor community who are you know pushing this entire agenda uh, of of gender lens uh, investing and and inclusive growth. So thank you so much for your insights there. Um, now moving on to um, Abhishek, um, could you please highlight the initiatives that which has been taken at Caspian, uh, like at Caspian Debt, on uh, gender lens investing and how do you actually define it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll probably uh, talk about the definition bit first and then uh, talk about the initiative. So, I mean, as far as our definition of gender lens investing is concerned and and, and as, in terms of the portfolio, uh, we look at, uh, I was very, uh, uh, inter I mean, it was very interesting for me to hear how Mitali talked about the different types of enterprises. So we actually categorize it in two categories. One is uh, women-led, which means uh, uh, it is founded by women, uh, so we've kind of clubbed a number of things. The CXOs are women, board members are women, or women impact businesses, which are businesses that uh, disproportionately positively impact a women customer. So the product or services are designed for women or they create jobs uh, for majority women. Uh, and within that also, for example, for a woman co-founded company, uh, what we're trying to look at is aspects around if the co-founder is a male, uh, what is the proportion of shareholding? Is it, uh, you know, it, uh, similar or is it lower and things like that? So uh, uh, that is how we look at the portfolio. But we also believe that uh, when it comes to gender uh, lens investing, uh, we actually can't be gender neutral in our approach and process. Uh, I think gender neutral uh, would possibly mean that it is with a male bias. So, uh, so I think there is a need to bring in a, a positive bias uh, because what we assume to be gender neutral is possibly not gender neutral. So right from sourcing or how the organization is structured, I think uh, it, it has a lot of impact. So if you look at uh, Caspian debt, uh, you know, we've been, tried to build in uh, gender equity into our policies and org structure. So if you look uh, look at us, 50% of the leadership team, people reporting to me uh, are uh, women. Uh, the, if you, the total number of women in the Caspian debt team is uh, has been more than 40% for a long time. It's still not 50, but uh, even maintaining a more than 40% of women in the team for a financial services company in my experience has been quite, it, it's, I, I don't see it in a lot of places, but somehow we've been able to do it. Our head of underwriting is woman. Credit committee has two women members. Uh, we actually, when we put out job descriptions, we uh, we looked at a few studies which said that you know if the job descriptions have certain words, women won't apply. So we make sure that uh, at least as per the research, our job descri descriptions are not uh, uh, dissuading women from applying. So we try to do those things. Uh, then there are other things like you know. Um, 
create giving uh, flexible work opportunities, not just for the women, but also for the men. For example, uh, when somebody has a kid, uh, uh, of course, women will get mat maternity leave, but can we enable the men employees to take or um, play a more important, you know, more active role in, uh, you know, raising the child, at least in the initial few years. So uh, more flexible work arrangements, more leaves for them. And then, of course, we pay for childcare. Uh, so that's that's on the team com composition. <laughs> but on the, you know, the portfolio side or, or business side, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are committed to the 2X initiative, which is a global uh, initiative of uh, development finance or impact investing firms, uh, wherein we have committed that at least 30% of the funding that we do uh, has to go to women, uh, women led or women impact businesses. Uh, overall, uh, last, last couple of years between 30 and 45% of the funding that we've done is actually to women led businesses. Uh, uh, since inception, whatever funding we've done, close to 30% of the companies are women-led. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've actually got involved with a lot of the incubators, accelerators. We've, in fact, worked with incubators and accelerators uh, and asked them to, for example, add a gender lens in their curriculum when they're training uh, you know, people for their entrepreneurship under their entrepreneurship programs. <coughs> So we we are kind of uh, we we uh, the senior management of Caspian Debt contributes time towards uh, those mentoring programs, those uh, you know uh, designing the curriculum for such programs as far as incubator accelerators is concerned. When we look at a loan proposal, we collect gender disaggregated data. So for example, every uh, deal proposal that comes to us on the first page, amongst many other things, it says whether it it identifies whether it is a women led or a women impact business. Because, like I said, we have a, given ourselves a target of pushing a certain, at least a certain amount of capital into women-led uh, businesses. Uh, we evaluate the HR policies. In fact, there have been instances where we've told companies that we will not make the loan unless you bring in certain policies like, say, maternity leave policies and all, which may not be very common in early stage companies. Uh, and we're surprised to see that there are companies that don't have that. Uh, in spite of them being VC funded and 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 so on, uh, so we we kind of push companies towards uh, you know bringing policies around that policies around non discrimination uh, as a part of the investment uh, uh, process. <laughs> and there are other things like you know uh, uh, making sure that if even if it's a small company on the smallest uh, smaller size. Uh, unlike a lot of financial institutions, uh, which require, for example, a husband or a father to come in and uh, be a guarantor or an introducer, we don't require any of that. Uh, I think we are way past uh, those kind of situations. Uh, so for us at Caspian Debt, it's at both levels, both at the company and an organization level as at, and at the ecosystem and business level where uh, gender is a cross-cutting thing. We are trying to employ more women we're trying to build awareness about gender lens amongst our portfolio companies. We're trying to build more capacity in our portfolio companies to build gender lens, even if they're not led by women. Uh, so all of this together, uh, you know, overall are the things that we're trying to do at Caspian Debt. Thanks, thanks, Abhishek, for actually throwing light on, you know, all the efforts uh, being done at Caspian's, uh, Caspian Debt's end. And uh, it's truly heartening to see the story, you know, from an from an NBFC, which focuses on gender inclusion in so many ways, like starting from, uh, you know, your uh, employees and actually having policies which are for both men and women in 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 the uh, in the organization. So I I think like kudos to you all for you know setting up that culture in in the in in your organization. And also, uh, really sorry, and and also thank you for being uh, today here in the panel in spite of you being slightly unwell. So so thanks thanks again there. Uh, so Mitali, now now over to you, and uh, and over here now looking at the time also. If very quickly you could uh, you know uh, just highlight some of the recommendations in the you know the gender lens investment toolkit that. 
uh, we have crafted together, which is again supported by USAID and worked by you know you and again uh, Design Associates for Samrit. So if you could just highlight some of that very quickly. Absolutely. So thanks a lot, Ritika. And I think I already introduced some of the concepts, but you know, just going a little bit into the depth of it. I think, Avishek, a lot of the points that you mentioned are actually part of our recommendations uh, for this GLI toolkit, because obviously Caspian is an industry leader, but as we you know, move forward and more and more VC funds start to come in, and as you said, you know, VC funds are probably not looking at some of these checklists as well uh, when it comes to the startups. And um, at the end of the day, if anybody in the, in the sector is trying to get a handy a checklist of what can they do. That is our attempt with this toolkit. And the framework that we've taken in the toolkit is a life cycle framework, as I mentioned. So, you know, we start with the early stage, the pre-application stage. The first challenge that I think, um, you know, Samrit was having, and then I think this will be quite typical for anybody who's trying to embark on this journey of uh, gender lens investing, is to first build a pipeline of applicants itself that, you know, where is it that you get some of these ideas from? And there's a huge market failure here, if we think about it, you know, because on one hand, you do have women entrepreneurs who are looking for funding, but then they don't have the information of where they can get the funding from. So this asymmetric information is something which uh, we believe that, you know, uh, the market makers particularly the investors can help to solve. And one of the ways is to look at data, you know, and to inform yourself that, okay, if, if for example, I am looking to increase, uh, you know, the proportion of women enterprises that I fund, but one of my criteria is that, you know, those enterprises must be of a certain, you know, uh, geographical representation or a particular sectoral representation, but you don't find women at the intersection of that geography and sector, then there's no way, uh, you know, that you'll be able to actually increase your pool. So relaxing some of those conditions is then the way to go about it. And that's why the first thing that we recommend is really to study the representation of women enterprises at a secondary level and look at some of the states, districts, data on women entrepreneurship and to also work with, you know, some of the places from which you can get that data, like such as some of the large industry associations from the incubators, which have a lot of data of, you know, the representation of women enterprises and to sort of build partnerships with these, with these networks and really have very strong networks. At, at a very local level to just basically increase the pipeline of your applicants. The second thing is, you know, looking at the application stage itself. Now, the one thing we definitely find is that women entrepreneurs typically end up struggling. We have had even very experienced women entrepreneurs tell us in consultations that, look, I just did not apply to this particular fund because I found the application form too confusing it was too many you know documents required and and sometimes they just you know are deterred because of this because of this one simple thing so just having that support during the application stage of course that support can be gender neutral you know but we do know that it will benefit women disproportionately um you know at the application stage and also having you know some mentoring training some kind of application support clinics can be thought about you know by the vcs uh to give women a little bit of an easy to navigate application process and application window then the third one is the selection process itself you know when a fund is sort of selecting women enterprises women led enterprises or women impact enterprises as you call and women focused enterprises as we call um at that point you know we really want to be able to see where the enterprise falls in a in a weighted average scale so we've actually created a small tool to evaluate where the women enterprises or women led or women focused enterprises sit one is of course the classification of are you women led or are you women focused exactly as Caspian uh, described but then there's also nuances within that for example you may be an enterprise that is led by a senior manager who is a woman 
but because you've put in place you know a system you now have a huge pipeline of women leaders coming in or women uh, you know coming in at entry level and that should make you have a higher score you know typically in and what you're doing for gender diversity and inclusion and therefore make you more qualified for a gender lens investment you know and to qualify again under the GLI framework so based on that we've actually created a very easy to use tool which which actually samrid has already circulated amongst their uh, you know current funded entities in order to be able to understand where they stand and you know have some baseline data and i think that is really going to help even at the selection process because at the end of the day that's that's where they decide okay now we have to have enterprises which are really high scoring or maybe we can also accept enterprises that are slightly a little bit you know low scoring but above average you know so it helps us in creating sort of a data mapping framework for selection and the last you know set of interventions and recommendations is in the post award stage at which point you know we we are recommending that some of the other vc funds can really start working intensely with the leadership teams of the awardees or those who actually get the funding first for capacity building that you are getting a set of funds now how are you going to deploy them in the best possible way do you need support for that if yes we have people available we have some technical assistance available and this is actually drawing from a lot of my experience of working with governments you know this recommendation because when we uh, you know i mean at either the adb or the world bank or any of the multilaterals when we work with governments we typically find that capacity is limited to be able to absorb the funding and when we work intensely with the teams in the governments and build their capacity then they are able to really deploy those funds in a very efficient way so i think that's the you know that's the sort of principle that we're applying here as well for you know for supporting the some of the new entrepreneurs in a technical manner so i think that's pretty much just a summary of of our recommendations but of course it's much much more than that <laughs> so i think ritika when we release the toolkit we have to do another round of uh, you know another round of this <laughs> yes definitely definitely so thanks thanks mitali for highlighting the key some of the key recommendations from the toolkit and um, and again your experience across government and and again working with various multilateral donors has definitely enhanced the the toolkit uh, at at a much larger level uh, so now we have come towards the end of the panel discussion and while we there are uh, quite a few questions but in the interest of time there uh, like couple of questions we have already uh, you know tried to answer Uh, in the second round, uh, which was already raised, but uh, but Abhishek, for you and Sohani, if any of you want to just highlight that, how can women-owned businesses best be located by investors? Considering one of their barriers is the visibility, and to be honest, like even we have seen some of that and faced some of that at Samrit. So so just wanted to know, Abhishek, uh, from you, and uh, maybe just a couple of lines from Sohani, uh, and then and then we will uh, move to the closing of the panel. Yeah, I'll go after Sohani. So Sohani, you are an entrepreneur, so you should talk about it first, and then probably I will say what we do. Right. Uh... so i think there should be more panels not just around women's day but generally around the year where there's more visibility of women entrepreneurs that we can do but also on a more uh, uh serious note there are things that do happen already in terms of reports for uh women in business there would be specific articles that would keep coming but i do feel that the same thing that a lot of that happens around march and all that information gets lost in the clutter so if we can have more features on women entrepreneurs in media and uh, discourses like these um and also in terms of having more special uh, uh either you know things like angel list exist for making uh, um connections between investors and entrepreneurs in general but there could be more specific uh, tools like these that could exist where you know people can people like ip global or usaid can highlight some of the women 
uh, led innovations which are funded by you guys and even not funded by you guys just like a sector mapping which could keep getting evolved over a period of time so there are resources like these that exist especially for climate tech etc but not so much around gender so those were a few things that i feel can help uh, uh, women entrepreneurs get more visibility so very quickly for us i think we've been uh, we don't know the, the, all the answers but a uh, few of the questions that we've kept asking is for example you have these startup networking sessions which is typically around dinner uh, and uh, drinks is it the best place to find women entrepreneurs probably not uh, you know how can you make it easier for women entrepreneurs to have a conversation with us 50% of our client facing team including the head of underwriting is a woman uh kind of consciously because we want to encourage so again there, there is a bias here but then it is just to make sure that uh women are more comfortable if if that is the issue is what we keep hearing so we've tried those things there are other things like for example what is a product if is the pro, is there a product design issue uh which uh, can we simplify the product language to make it easier not to say that women don't understand complicated products but is there something that is to be done in the product design is something that we are now doing a study on trying to figure out if we can create more products that is more suitable for women enterprises or women impact businesses uh so so these are a few things and of course the several other things that uh, a lot of the other panelists said and i would be very keen to know of other ways in which we can make it easier but yeah so that's that's all that's that's that those are a few things that we do thanks thanks abhishek uh for for answering the questions and uh, apart from that we also have a couple of more questions but in the interest of time we would definitely answer this later and we will reach out through jo to to answer some of these questions so now just very quickly on the closing remarks so uh, you know today's panel like uh, with samrit uh, team put together so you know as the p3 award winner uh, samrit truly believes in the power of partnerships and and this panel today starting from our you know the donor uh, caspian um, who is also one of our very important partners then uh, suhani who is you know funded under samrit and 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 mitali who is supporting a lot of our gender lens investing toolkit work is is actually bringing together all these important partnerships um and 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 really communicate the you know like how gender lens investing can actually uh help in in really bringing about economic growth and inclusive growth so um, and definitely i think we all agree through this panel that the road to entrepreneurship has been very it's it's a difficult one for for women and i'm sure uh, a lot of times also for um, like you know organizations that are co-founded by by women but again uh, what we want to really develop here and 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 leave with a very positive note that you know there are like we do have gender lens investing we do have organizations like uh, you know caspian we do have very interesting uh, you know journeys of women entrepreneurs like like suhani and then we have very uh, important donors like like usaid who really you know are pushing that agenda very consciously to to be more gender inclusive and and that is what really makes uh, you know the the real difference in the ecosystem and and slowly and steadily we are moving towards that ecosystem change so with that positive note i would like to thank all the panel members uh, who contributed uh, like so immensely to, to the you know the information uh, today at at the panel and uh, over to you joe for the final closing thanks rithika and on behalf of concordia thank you all for joining us today thank you again to samrid rithika and today's esteemed panel for sharing their expertise and most importantly for the work they're doing every day on this important issue We hope this conversation brings greater awareness to the subject and we encourage you to learn more about the critical work that our panelists do each day. A follow-up email will be distributed next Thursday with the recording of today's event and the opportunity to connect with today's panel as well as Sam Red to continue this discussion. Thank you again and have a great day.